Support by the Hope Network Center for Autism. You can join us and be part of a mission that takes on the challenges, the barriers, the statistics, the seemingly impossible, and help us overcome them all. HopeNetwork.org slash autism. At Bayer County Jail in San Antonio, Texas, the biggest problem isn't the murderers or the drug dealers. It's the gangbangers. They've turned Bayer into a battleground. They're going to get dropped. That's the way it's going to be. Where rivals face off behind bars. This really is a power struggle. And everyone is pushed to the edge. It's a war. It's a war. From inmates caught in the crossfire. Got to beat badly by four inmates. To the officers trying to maintain control. Fractured skulls, broken arms, broken ribs. It happens. In the volatile world of Bayer County Jail, it's gang war in San Antonio. These dudes will kill you. <laughs> to figure out the gang's next moves, the jail uses informants from inside their ranks. But when they break the gang's strict code of silence, the inmates have to remain anonymous. Like this Mexican mafia informant, codenamed Teardrop. I grew up in an era where everybody loved the Mexican mafia in the streets. These guys do parties, they get you into the clubs, large amounts of money, carrying big old machine guns and stuff like that. And you know, oh man, I wanna be like them. You have to commit attempted murder or a murder in order to be a Mexican Mafia member. I've done many hits with a chank and with a firearm. Also known as the M or Las Letras, the Mexican Mafia has dominated San Antonio street crime with ruthless efficiency for 30 years. They've even put their code in writing. We created a constitution for the sole purpose of anything illegal murder, contract killings, extortion, drugs, prostitution. But the past decade has seen the rise of a splinter group behind bars, the gang known as the Tango Orajon. These inmates used to do the dirty work for the Mexican Mafia. Now, they want to run the jail. We've been seeing an uprise in the Tango Orajon. Currently in this jail, we have over 700 confirmed members of the Tango Orejon, but they're recruiting on a daily basis. By this time next year, we could be well into the thousands. Informant Payaso is from the Tango Orejones. He started as a foot soldier in the Mexican Mafia's highly regimented army. I got locked up when I was 16 for aggravated assault. I ended up joining the Tango de Honk. We used to be under the Mexican Mafia. They had us doing their dirty work. You know, whatever they wanted us to do, we would do. Tired of following the Mafia's orders, they decided to split off about 10 years ago. That's when we split up, we went to war with them, and we stood strong and finally broke off. More and more of the Orajones are young and aggressive. Answering to no authority at all, which makes them even more dangerous. <laughs> to cope with a growing gang problem, the jail has decided to segregate the enemies. To house each gang in its own separate pods, spread over the six floors of the facility. Our concept is if we have to house them somewhere, let's house them in a place where we're going to have the least amount of problems. If we segregate them, we take them out of population, contain them there, we tend to be a lot more productive in dealing with these gangs. We also are able to learn more about them. And there's the old saying, know your enemy. But it's not always easy to figure out where new arrivals belong especially guys like Jose Angel Santos. 
He's a tango or home who wants out of gang life completely. I'm an ex-member. I just came to realize that I didn't want any part of it. I didn't want to make this a lifestyle, so I just decided to get out of it. I saw a lot of foul things happen. I had my share of riots, and I did what I had to do to get by. To get out of the order homes, you have to subject yourself to at least one beating. It's a uh, beating from two to three individuals for a period of two to five minutes, depending on the, the person in charge at the moment. But in Jose's case, the beatings have never stopped. On several occasions, I got jumped. On others, you know, I, I had just fought one-on-one. -on -one. They it wouldn't leave me alone because I was an ex-member. A five-time offender, recently arrested on drug charges, Jose is depressed to find himself back in intake. It's been hard. It's been a hard year. It is just so much coming at me. I didn't know how to act. Jose's trying to pull himself together, but he's worried. Will he be attacked again? Tuesday, 3 p.m. A code two is called. Officer in need of assistance. A fight between inmates in one of the Orajon units. Cert moves into action. A SWAT team behind bars. It's Cert's goal to arrive within 90 seconds, hopefully before any serious damage can be done. Three Orajones have jumped one of their own over a perceived slight. According to the officers, when Orajones feel disrespected, they respond with violence. Sergeant Avila is in charge of this SRT unit. He knows how tough this jail can be. You know, this is the most violent place you can work. I've been stabbed in the head before, you know, thank God I had a helmet on. You don't know if the first guy is going to start stabbing you as opposed to getting on the ground. So is adrenaline involved? Most definitely. That and fear, it's there. You just have to control it. A 10-year veteran, Avila understands the importance of an organized response when chaos breaks out. The CERT team was developed and created in order to be able to respond, organized, trained, prepared. When an inmate blockades his door, SRT can handle tricky cell extractions like this because they're ready to come down hard if they need to. If extracting an inmate gets violent, and so be it. He should have done what he was told, and that wouldn't have happened. Chest down on the floor right there. Put your hands behind your back. We've sent inmates to the hospital, broken, fractured skulls, broken arms, broken ribs, torn ears, broken eye socket. It happens. You know, the inmate gets treated the way he acts, and I tell inmates that all the time. If you act like a jerk, you're going to get treated like a jerk. Avila is not only a cert sergeant, he's also the supervisor of the second floor, where Mafia and Orajon members are housed. Okay, so we got a time start, we got to hold the maintenance, we got to hold the CID. This whole floor is like a little city. I have almost a thousand people on just this floor that I supervise. That's what I'm in charge of. I'm like the mayor. Close your doors behind you. This floor has 12 units in it. Eight of them are locked down, which means the inmates house in there only come out one hour a day. It's a very busy place. How's the left side been behaving? The biggest issue for Avila on the second floor? The tango or the home. 
Unlike the Mexican mafia, they follow no rules. You know, we have several gangs in this jail, lots of gang members, but the Tango Otajones are the ones that are causing us the most grief right now. They have no laws, they have no rules, they don't abide by anything. You know, these are just people who have banded together for protection, so they say. They've actually become the aggressors now. Represent that 15! That quince! In the Otajon unit on the second floor, gang members are meeting to discuss their next moves. They'll only talk to the media as a group. They opened up this tank about a month ago, nothing but Orejones. Something that went down between the Mexican Mafia and us. They separated us all and opened up this tank for us. Now there's more than, I think there's about two or three tanks now just for us Orejones. They say the Tango Order Home does everything by consensus. We don't got to be under nobody, you know I mean? We're our own group and we stand on our own. With no leaders, no gang structure, it's a fine line between democracy and anarchy, a line the Order Homes frequently cross. I say basically, the majority of those that are in here, we're in here for smashing on the letra. One of our homeboys got stabbed by the Mexican Mafia. So we set it off in the whole in the whole jail. Once you see them, you're supposed to, you know, smash, just smash them. You know, when it gets out of line, no matter how many people they got or how many people we got, we're gonna jump. Their goal: to impose their will on the inmates of this jail. You can go visitation. You can go to child hall. You can go to uh, uh, rec. Smash. You just smash on site because they'll get the opportunity to do it to you, and it's already it's already been like that. It's been going like that for a minute now. It's a war. It's a war. On the other side of the facility, Rodriguez is talking with two longtime members of the Mexican Mafia, Mike and Alfonso. They say they've decided to leave the gang for good, to leave their bloody past behind. So I'm assuming he's with the uh, cartels then? Yeah. There's a guy named, uh, they call it Chon. Mike and Alfonso have learned over the years that the Mexican Mafia is highly structured. You ever his nephew? Yeah. Now he's supposedly the one in charge over here? Yeah. He's not a puppet. He was a, he was a, a, a sergeant of the population. Unlike the unruly order home, the Mafia is a kind of criminal corporation doing business in drugs, extortion, and murder. It's all about following orders. If they call me at 3 in the morning, I'm going to have to get up and go, no questions asked. You got people coming out every day, going in, coming out day in and day out of the Texas Department of Corrections, you know, with contract hits with orders, with all kinds of things that, that they need to be done. Extortion, drugs, uh, murder for hire, all that. We'd pick up anywhere from five to 20 to 30 to $40,000 a week. You know, nice cars, nice this, nice that. I've had the Rolex watches, the nice chains. I mean, $1,000 in my pocket seven days a week. You know, I could spend $1,000 a day and not think twice, you know? I mean, can you imagine? Somebody but the perks come at a price. They have to carry out the green lights, the killings, each and every time they're ordered to. People out there in the world, they can't grasp. They don't understand how, how can this guy go kill this guy or stab this guy or beat up this guy just because the next guy told him to. I buried so many of my bros. The guy at the funeral home knew me on a first name basis. So then one day, my uncle dies, and the guy tells me, he goes, he goes, oh, no, man. He goes, I'm going to give you a discount because you brought me so much business. And it was like a lot of people were killed. You know, I thought in the back of my mind, you know. <laughs> and well, I, you're probably going to tell you, you brought, you brought me a lot of business. You know, and it was like, <laughs> and I was like, it was I mean, one of those odd moments. Like, he goes, he goes, oh, no, man. He goes, I'm going to charge you 50% on the coffin. and and I'm gonna, you know, the flowers are gonna be free. You know, the spray that we're gonna throw over the coffin is gonna be free. And I'm thinking, man, have I been to this place that many times? Mike and Alfonso soured on the Mexican mafia when they saw their friends get killed. You don't have to do nothing wrong, man. When it comes down to it, you become a liability. Why? 
because you know too much. So what they'll do to cover their asses, they'll eliminate you. If you go back into history, 99% of the victims of the Mexican Mafia have been their own members. You can leave the Tango order home, but there is no way out of the Mexican Mafia, except in a body bag. In the patch of the Mexican Mafia, they have a two-headed serpent and that's called blood in, blood out. One way in, one way out. You know, you have to commit an act to get in, and if you want out, you're gonna be murdered. Mike and Alfonso do want out, and they know the risks. They've been moved into a special unit designed to protect ex-Mafia members. But they know they're not truly safe. You're gonna have to live the rest of your life with somebody have you, trying to kill you. Now all they can do is look over their shoulders. Friday afternoon. Concerned about the unpredictable Orajon gang, the officers decide to make a preemptive strike. Sergeant Avila gives the orders for a shakedown in the Orajon unit in pod BB. Do not rush with the strip searching. Don't rush them. Don't let them rush you. You think they might be hiding something? Strip them again, OK? These guys are working on our clock, all right? Sure. OK. Try not to let the keys rattle too much. We don't want them knowing that we're coming in. Hard and fast. Anyone that doesn't get on the ground, you put them on the ground, OK? All right, six and six. Yes. Yes, they're coming downstairs. Just six cells, so we gotta double them up the cells. Double them up, just the first six cells. We're doing what's called an inspection, or what's commonly called a shakedown. The purpose being to look for contraband, uh, weapons, drugs. These inspections are key to keeping the amount of drugs, contraband, weapons that we find down. Put your hands behind your back. We'll come in fast and hard with the cert team, and then we'll put everyone down. Where's the hole? We'll put them away. We'll strip them in their cells. We'll bring them out of the cell, search the cell. The cert team turns the pod upside down. When we do a cell inside, it's a mess but we're in a purpose. We're looking for something, and we get the job done. I don't care what he says, put him in handcuffs. <laughs> Trustee, start pushing that down, let's go. These shakedowns are very important. It's how we find drugs, weapons, escape plans. We had a plan last year. Uh, several inmates had gotten together with a, an officer, and they had picked up saw blades, and they started cutting through the wrecked roof, and we're going to escape. We found clothing that they had dyed. We found the blades that they used. They were going to go that night. And we were able to foil all that before it happened because of a shakedown. What we have here is a homemade tattoo ring. It's pretty simple, but it's effective. They usually uh, conceal it under ramen noodles or whatnot. You know, the inmates do get creative and probably uh, can lead them into disciplinary actions. Found it on the ramen noodle bank. I was crushing it up. Good. I the bulk in it. Uh, what happened is. Um, Today, we found some tattoo rigs, which is what they commonly use to tattoo themselves here in the jail. Jailhouse tats are really important. You know, this is how these guys identify each other. Gang tattoos stand out like a military uniform, declaring who's on which side of the battle. The wrong ones will get you killed. In the Autohones, it's often a 210 or a spur 
the symbols of San Antonio's area code or its pro basketball team. The mafia here prefer Aztec gods, two-headed snakes, and of course, the letters of Las Letras. It stands for the letter M in Spanish. Instead of saying Mexican mafia, people would say, I'm M. On the second floor, the CERT team responds to a call for help. An inmate's in trouble, threatening to hurt himself. It's Jose Angel Santos, ex Orajon's gang member. He says he's cracking under the pressure. I'm suffering from trauma, man. Last time I spent nine months in here, I got beat badly by four inmates. By four inmates? By four inmates. Okay. On three different occasions, I got jumped. Okay. I, I witnessed somebody hang herself on Christmas. Right. I was traumatized by that, man, because I was one of the last persons that spoke to that guy before he did that. Okay. Then I happened to witness him. As Jose and opens up, the officers discover that just before they got there, he tried to hang himself. Stuff that's building up inside you, and you're just yeah. you're freaking out. I'm good because I got no support from my family. I got nobody. For Sergeant Avila, there are no easy answers here. He wants to understand if Jose's tried to kill himself before. You ever tried to commit suicide in the past? How? In my wrist. What'd you cut yourself with? Sir? What did you cut yourself Glass? with? A piece of ass? What was, what was the reason for that incident? Why were you feeling suicidal that time? My sister had passed away. OK. Well, um, so you're going to go down. You're going to speak with mental health. Um, tell them what you told me. Let them know. And then we'll go from there, OK? Yes, sir. All right, just walk them down there and have a sit. I've been going through a lot of anxiety, depression. My last stay here, I stayed here about eight and a half months. I witnessed a lot of stuff. I had gotten jumped twice. And on the third time, it was four guys. They stomped my head into the ground. I got scars here on my arm from the tennis shoes, the friction. They had kicked me and stuff like this. And uh, I was kind of traumatized by that. They put me in a one-man cell, started hearing voices, couldn't cope with it. So I did attempt suicide. I um, made two attempts to tie my sheet and fish it through a vent. I actually had gotten up up here, stepped on this up. And with the pin, with the pin, I actually kind of like made a hook, tied real thin, and fished it through. I tied a knot there and then tied an, uh, like a string about like this so that it wouldn't move and uh, it wasn't it wasn't sturdy enough. So when I got to down here, I tried tying the, the knot there and it just would bust. The sheet wouldn't take my body weight. So I failed. A flimsy sheet saved his life this time. but no one is sure if he'll try again. <laughs> Officer Rodriguez checks in on the unit of former Mexican Mafia members where Mike and Alfonso are housed. But when Rodriguez pulls another ex-Mafia member aside, the conversation takes a surprising turn. The inmate is not exactly what he seems. Uh, we had you down as ex mafia, but now you're saying you're active. Yes, sir. So what are you? You uh, prospecto, canal, what are you? You're feed me. Right you're feed me. Yeah. Okay, so you okay to go with those people? Yeah. Now, what about all this time you spent? With Two the months ago, gonna, this, this inmate said he was out of the Mexican mafia, but now he's revealing he never left. He was just pretending to have retired. We saw those incidents going on. He did it for a reason. Murder. For any specific reason? I was trying to go for one guy, but really I ain't gonna say a name, but I couldn't, I never got be able to get close to him. Can you tell me who ordered you to do that? Oh, uh, no, nah, I can't say who ordered me, but. Okay, and why couldn't you get to him? Because there was no, there was no chances, you know, I was, mm -hmm. 
I was trying to get close to him, but getting moved out of groups, groups, but I never... You never, you never could do it, huh? Never so do you it. Just find he was on orders from the mafia to work his way inside the ex-member's pod and kill one of them. It could be Mike or Alfonso. He won't reveal his target. They told me to do it, but like if I wanted to, and I jumped up on but it. I thought you can't do that in county jail. I thought you can't clean up in county jail like that. No, you could. Okay. Now, uh, by doing so, that would have progressed you up to prospect. So do you have a To this gangster, kind of murder is just the price you pay to show your loyalty to the Mexican mafia. He's locked up right now in Pennsylvania. It's like you did all the I just felt that they were going to show me more love than my real family. So. Money, and cars, and girls, and all that. That's just the way it is. These dudes will kill you. You got people waiting in line to join the Mexican Mafia. And you have to have blood on your hands in order to be a Mexican Mafia member. This letter right here says that you're an affiliate of the Mexican Mafia. And this letter is going to authorize me to house you with active members of the Mafia. Sign here and initial where it says affiliate. After failing to commit the hit, this gangbanger wants to go back to his friends in the active Mexican Mafia unit. For Mike and Alfonso, the situation is looking more precarious than ever. There may be hit orders out on them. Nine a.m. Friday, Avila's CERT team gets a call. Inmates are acting out. In any war, there's collateral damage. Where y'all going? Don't worry about it. Already. Since the majority of gang members spend up to 23 hours a day in their cells, locked down because of gang activity, sometimes they go over the edge. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. Routinely, CERT is called in to handle inmates who have lost control. These eruptions can be dangerous. At risk from more gang violence, traumatized and depressed, Jose attempted suicide. Now, the challenge is where to house him. Jose feels at risk in general population. They can't put him in with the gangs. And he doesn't want to go into protective custody for fear that it might label him as a snitch and make him more of a target. That leaves a quote unquote jacket that you will carry with you throughout any jail or prison or wherever you go, it follows you. Somebody will know you wherever you go. The officers decide to place him in the homosexual pod. They ran out of options. They would no longer house me in a general population with other gang members because classification had to take the precaution. They would have been able to justify why I got beat up. Jose has three children with three different women, but now he's in with the gay population. It's the only place he might be safe, given his gang past. I was kind of forced into the homosexual pod because of my past experiences. On several occasions, I got jumped. On others, I had just fought one-on-one. -on -one. And even as a solo, they wouldn't leave me alone because I was an ex-member. So Jose is left in his new unit, unsure just what will happen next. In this special pod on the second floor, ex-gang members have banded together for protection. Still, they know that it's open season on them. Alfonso is aware that the Mexican Mafia has a standing hit out on him. What he didn't know when he came to this unit 
was that his own celly was supposed to murder him. I was ordered to kill this guy two times. I refused to do it. And I told him, look, man, look what these, look, look what these guys are trying to do to you, you know? And, and you know, they, had, they, they were trying to say that he was a snitch, that he was cooperating. I, I, I owe him my life. You know, uh, he, he saved my life. One day I was ordered at a meeting that I was supposed to kill this guy because supposedly he was an informant. But later I found out that it wasn't true. What it was is the main guy was just trying to, to clear his save his He wasn't sure, he didn't want to take no chances, so he said, you know what? Better, better safe now than sorry later. So, you know, kill this guy. By this time I had already lost faith and I said, you know what, the hell with you guys. And I was contacted again, hey man, no, we want you back. All you gotta do is kill your celly. The reason I, I, I'm not so uh, shocked is because, you know, what he's talking about, I've already lived it. You know, and, and you know, You've seen it done I've seen it done and, and, and I've seen people experience that. So, you know, I mean, some of my best friends were killed. You know, and, and it's sad to say that you know. I mean, I mean, can you imagine going to a, going to a bar or to a, a sporting event or eating dinner with his family, Christmas, New Year's, and the next day, you know, hey, you gotta kill this dude, or this dude, this dude's murdered. Go bury him. To have to be involved in one of a close friend of yours murder. Hey, Amen. It's gonna affect you, dude. It's gonna affect you. When anyone can turn on you at any moment, Mike and Alfonso can't be sure where the danger will be coming from next. Monday, second floor of the county jail. Officers can sense the mood in the pod is getting worse. Something bad is coming. And within only a few hours, the violence that's been building finally erupts. Fresh blood on the floor tells the story. An inmate has been brutally beaten. It's an attack by the Tango Orajon gang. We had a group of uh, nine or 10 inmates, Tango Orejones, and allegedly there was one member that was either suspected or confirmed to be a uh, Mexican mafia. And, uh, some kind of uh, order went through, a green light, to assault him. So as soon as they came out under one hour of uh, a day room time, the, the victim, you know, he was assaulted. The Orajon believed that a new inmate in the pod was actually a member of the Mexican Mafia, so they decided to jump him. In fact, no one knew his gang for sure, but unaffiliated new inmates are often attacked, according to informant Payaso. The door opens up, everybody's hoping, man, there's a new dude coming in, we're all hoping, man, maybe it's a Netra. Everybody's hoping that they, for some reason, they made a mistake and they're bringing in a Mexican Mafia in there or something so they can get to him. The victim is sent off to the hospital, and the ringleaders are moved to the intensive supervision wing for a spell of solitary confinement. We had 10 guys beat up one guy. That was a riot. 
you know, lock the unit down. Everyone gets secured and gets put in the house. The tango or the horn, they're actually the ones that have caused most of the problems for us, but they do not understand. They think they can just behave how they will, how they want, and there won't be any repercussions because of that, but they're wrong. Those dudes messed up, man, you know. You know, they just got caught For the ex-Mexican mafia members, the incident is bloody confirmation of what they already knew. In the 1600s, 1700s, this type of uh, lifestyle, you know, it's, it's, it's a train wreck waiting to, be, to, to happen, you know. In this life, there's only two roads you can wind up in, and that's in prison for life or dead. <laughs> you would tell us but for ex-members, there's an irony that cuts even more we'll deeply. We'll they joined a gang for brotherhood, but in the end, it's these same brothers that are coming after them. I sacrificed my life for those guys, you know. What they wanted done, I did it. And at the end, I got crossed out. You know, my own carnales crossed me out. And now I'm here fighting for my life. You'd be surprised, you know, the things that, that, that people are killed for. You know, it's petty, man. Say we're mafia members. Say he's in charge. And say he tells, he tells this guy and me, hey, I want you to kill this guy. So we go kill him. You know what's going to happen to me? He's going to have to cover his ass, so I'm going to be killed. Then they're going to take you for that gangster ride, you know? And what I mean by gangster ride, you know, they're going to tell you, hey, let's go get, let's get a couple of beers. Two or three homeboys are going to get in the car. You're going to be sitting in the front seat. Next thing you know, you got a bullet hole in the back of your head. It's real, man. It's real. It's real, it's real nasty as far as getting sent home in a box, you know? I mean, that's, that's it's, it's the real thing. In the homosexual pod, ex Orajon gang member Jose is trying to keep a low profile. He's decided he has no problem being there. In fact, he says he's actually had homosexual experiences himself, at least behind bars. Well, I guess the thing with me is, is that I've come to realize that, hey, you know, I'm bisexual. This is actually my first time being housed with homosexuals. It's a live soap opera. Who are you speaking to? What am I going to ask for? All the screaming, the hollering. They always saying some off the wall type stuff. Jose's due to go to court soon to find out his sentence. At this point, I don't even know where I stand right now as far as in what direction I want to go. I've been in and out of jails. I've been through rehabs, halfway homes, uh, whatnot, inpatient, outpatient programs. People think in their eyes that this is the best place for me. As for what comes next, Jose has no idea. He's still too unnerved to figure out what the future holds. At this point, I'm not really thinking about the future. I take it one day at a time. It's, I've never set any long-term goals. Things don't go according to plan. That's why it's not good to plan ahead. You see what I'm saying? In their high security unit, ex-Mafia members Mike and Alfonso may be looking over their shoulders for the next you threat. It was like a sack of but in many ways, they're making a new start. The the world had been man, lifted, the man. day I became an ex-gang member, Woo. I knew I didn't have to answer to nobody. I didn't have to carry myself in. I, I was my own man, dude. I didn't have to. It was like a, a brick. Like he said, a sack of potatoes off your shoulders. I feel man. like it's over with. It was like I was a new man, dude. It's, it's like, I mean, it's, it's like weird. you're drowning and you come up for air. You know, like, <gasps> all those years, you know, carrying a gun, a 45 in my waistband, uh, selling large amounts of cocaine, of heroin, having $2,000 in my pocket, the women, the clubs, all that. 
was foolishness. It was foolishness. And now I felt like my own man. I'm a real man, dude. He actually, he, he's, he's the actual first, first real friend that I've, I've ever really ever made in life. You know, because I can actually say that I can trust him with my life and he can trust me with his. But inside Bayer, for every inmate that leaves the gangs, several more are joining. And the Tango Orajones show no sign of slowing down. It's just going so fast, you know? I mean, the youngsters, they're coming and just going wild. We're showing them we can be our own, you know, and, and if it takes to go, you know, smash with them or go to war with them, that's what, that's what it's going to be. It's been war. Whenever they got a chance, they're, they're going to smash on us. When we get a chance, we're going to smash on them. And so Officer Rodriguez and the gang unit are left the difficult task of combating a problem that may never really go away. Bear County will do everything they can to deter gangs, but we also understand that we cannot completely stop them. Many of these gang members, their fathers are part of the gang, their brothers are part of the gang, so for them, this is really a part of their life. So when they say it's never gonna end, Unfortunately, they probably are correct. Ain't nothing gonna stop it. It's like a cancer. It just grows and grows and grows. You know, you can cut it out little bits and pieces at a time by doing roundups and, and all kinds of stuff. But you know what? It ain't never gonna stop.